Rob Bell. Now, I could probably just leave the intro right there and just say Rob Bell and be done with it. That's good enough, but y'all gonna have to endure with me for just a second because listen, when I was about 18 years old, I had this boyfriend. He was in ministry and I remember him sharing with me these videos. Now these videos were this young pastor guy. He was kind of hip and I used the term back then, new agey. He used storytelling and media to ask these very direct questions about our faith. Now I was a very insecure person. And so anything that threatened my very black and white thinking was met with anger. And it wasn't until a couple of years after that, when I started a deep healing process that I realized that my own resistance to things was a beautiful invitation to find freedom and a whole other side to God that I had no idea existed. Since then, I have just consumed almost everything from Rob Bell, and I'm so grateful for his body of work. Now, he was a pastor of one of America's largest growing churches, and then turned into an author, an artist, has written 14 books and plays that have been translated in over 25 different languages. And for those of us who follow his work, man, I know we're all internally grateful for the freedom that his work points to, and the invitation to play and explore and enjoy the mystery mysteries of God. This year he announced that he was writing his first fiction novel about an imaginary world and a whole bunch of folks on a new planet in this book, Where Do You Park Your Spaceship? Y'all, it was a freaking gift to get to sit down with Rob Bell to talk about this new book, the power of storytelling and creativity, and Lord Jesus, why no planet worth anything is without Good bread. It's a spacious emptiness that is actually out that out of which creation actually arises. Engage with a story that's made up and you actually can get to real, strangely enough, faster. For someone who's curious like me, what would you tell me? You will have encounters today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see you're like, you're asking all the, these are all the best. These are the most interesting questions. Y'all, oh, it's a good day today. It is a good day today because not only am I going to get to talk to Rob Bell, who I have been following for, I want to say 17 years, a really long time, like back in the day, back in the day, all your podcasts, books, all the things. But what's even cooler about this is not only getting to meet this awesome man right here, but getting to talk about something so fun, this new book. Where'd you park your spaceship? And yeah, right, folks, I am wearing a UFO t-shirt right now in honor of this incredible day. Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's so great to be with you. What a fantastic intro with the t-shirt. God, we're already just, yeah, we're already on you know, fire. Let's, let's just do it. I just want to have so much fun with this. And I told you before, um, I'm the type of gal that I have done all the nonfiction stuff, read all the self-help books, all the whatever. It's very rare that I pick up a fiction book. And you said in another interview, and I'm paraphrasing here, something along the lines of kind of giving yourself permission to be creative and play and explore. And I really resonated with that because like I said before we hit record, there's so much depth in this book. There's so much that I pulled from it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It's very entertaining. It's hilarious. There's some really funny lines in it. But also reading through, I was like, damn, this is deep. This is so freaking deep and made me ask myself questions I hadn't asked before. So first of all, thank you. Thank you for the courage to step out of the norm and write plays and books about spaceships and so forth. I have some really specific questions about this book. Oh, let's go. Okay. Yeah. And those of you who are watching, if you have not read it, I don't want this to detour you because I promise you, you'll relate to something in this. Okay. But let's go first to page 68. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's this character and his name's Heen. Southern way of saying Heen. And he's a staker. He finds himself in this job where he is um, doing what he does well, which is... 
measuring out and being very into the details. Let me turn to it real quick. I'm going to read. There's this woman named Spy V. And he's getting frustrated. He is because all these folks keep walking up to him and interrupting him from his job. And he's like, go away. I'm trying to focus. I'm trying to focus. And they're coming in and they're asking him questions and they're pointing <laughs> over here. And he's getting frustrated. I was told to do this one thing. And so Spy V comes over and she says, listen, pay attention. People are giving you information all the time about themselves, about the world, how it all works. Don't fight it. Don't ignore it. Take it in and notice. So, Rob Bell, with that. <laughs> that was the best setup. That is the best setup for a question. I love it. This is my question. And this is what I'm talking about where you're telling a story, but it makes me think about something else. As I've been exploring creativity and trying to get better at my own play and imagination, I keep hearing this advice from seasoned creatives that you want to become more aware and you want to take more stuff in and become more curious. Yeah. And when I read that line, I wrote, how do you open yourself up and take things in and see it all as clues and data and stuff to be interested in without taking it all in? Yeah. 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 Uh, what it, yeah. Yeah. That is the question. Uh, one way is to move a half step slower. So, uh, like somebody who says I'm busy. Yeah, I'm so busy too. Oh, I'm so busy. I know. I know how it is. It's so busy. I don't know how it is. I'm, my day isn't full. It's full, but not full. Like busyness. What do you mean? Busyness is like a drug that for so many people, it's just how you talk about things. Oh, my schedule's been crazy. Oh, mine too. Crazy, busy. Think of the words that are normalized as just how life is. When, why? Mm -hmm. Why? We have more labor-saving devices than ever. So, so one of the economic societal diseases is we have more time-saving devices than ever, which instead of giving people more time to be enjoying or whatever people just work do even more so mm. moving a half step slower so like if you're in a store you're talking you have time and you're not rushed when you're driving somewhere and if a friend calls you actually have time so you're just able to notice it's a spacious emptiness that is actually out that out of which creation actually arises. So you're finding that own spaciousness within yourself. What about energetically? So mm -hmm. I'm taking it all in. Right. I don't want to necessarily soak up some things. Yeah, yeah. So I would call it being energetically zipped up. I will even do a motion like with a zipper if I ever sense like so that it doesn't stick to me. Yeah, it's not that's not mine. That right there is not mine. Wow. Yeah, so so I'm, yeah, you become very tuned in to what's yours and what isn't. Mm, that's so and, good. And uh, like that, it, it's almost, weirdly enough, the paradox is the more you are tuned in to how ever there's a seamless unity that holds everything together, that ev that all of this is one thing, that all parts and divisions happen within a whole. Okay, so think about a grocery store. There's you and then there's the grocery store. So right. you go into the grocery store and buy the food off the shelves. But the person who put the shelves on the store, um, put, who put the food on the shelves, how did they know what food to put on the shelves? They know what food to put on the shelves because of wh what you bought. Mm -hmm. So a grocery store is actually an interrelated phenomenon in which the people who are going into the store are determining and shaping what even gets put on the shelves by their buying patterns. So a grocery store is both a building with food on shelves and employees, but without the people, it isn't coming in. It actually isn't a grocery store. So it's a whole. The grocery store is a whole that includes everything. Are you with me on this? You see how interesting this gets? Yeah, I, and that's kind of, I feel like a huge theme of this book. Yes. And I even had it written down. Um, there's this part that 
I love this line. It says randomness all the way down. <laughs> and to give context for this, so Hingru Bears, he is given this job later on in the story. And he kind of does what we all do, where it's kind of like, what is the worth and the value in this place and his position? And he has this realization that what he does reporting to these higher people, hierarchy people, right, 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 what they do, right. And so there is, he says, it's all really the randomness all the way down. And I had a big question mark here about impact. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because my thought is like, okay, well, where is my? And this is ego, I guess, coming in mm -hmm. or therapy mm -hmm. comes in, but like when you want to make an impact and you want to make a difference and really none of it is making more of an impact or more of a difference. It's like, how do you find, I guess, your contribution in that? Or should we even, does that even right, matter? Right, right, right. Because that yeah. is in many ways. Yeah. 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 I'll oh, see. You're like, you're asking all the, these are all the best. These are, these are the most interesting questions. So if you go back to the grocery store, as you become aware that the whole thing is a whole, uh -huh. it's a whole and all these parts, which appear to be parts, you, me, the person working in the grocery store, me, when you realize that it all actually forms a whole one, then you realize that all the divisions, however real they are, actually mm -hmm. have a have a, a dimension of illusion to them. So this person who I'm talking to is showing me something about myself, about us. So everything gets way more interesting. This person has come to show me something about us, about me. They're my teacher. All of this is, so the border and boundary between me and everything else around me, uh, I am noticing more and more about what's happening inside of me. I'm cleaning this up. And that's mm -hmm. what shapes the whole thing. There is no out there. Mm -hmm. So like what ha starts happening in the story is Heen is realizing this system that I thought was a thing outside of me, I am have actually been shaping the whole time. So when Heather takes, you, like you mentioned therapy, when, when you discover one of those, sometimes they feel like knots that you've carried around for years and then you untie them. Yeah. When Heather does that, when that happens within you, the, that's happening for the whole thing. That's the healing of the whole thing. That's the clarity of the whole thing. Kind of like that cheesy, and as I would butcher this cheesy quote, but the one about, you know, if you want to make a difference in the world, you start with yourself. I mean, because really, truly, that is impacting. Yes. yes. Yeah. And, the, yeah. and the person who is most cranked up and zealous about fixing the world out there, you always know, your deep, intuitive Heather knowing just wonders what pain they're running from. Ooh. Like, how many times have you seen somebody who's on a, a mission and something within you is like, I don't know, it feels a little wobbly, feels a little mm -hmm. dodgy. I wonder what that's about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Clean this up. Do this. Do, do the self-inquiry. Do that work. And all sorts of new things happen. Lord Jesus. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so <You're> even. Right <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating how it actually works. It's actually fascinating how it actually works. Yeah. And it can be fun. And that's, why, again, why I appreciate you putting it in the narrative that you did. Because, I mean, I'm not one that, like, walks around questioning the education system. But now I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what, and it's really interesting you say that. Because, like, in the story, uh, like, he is just telling you what, what he's telling you about his classes. And his dad is trying to explain to him how education didn't used to be like that. But yeah. all it does in the story is, like when Spy V and is helping Heen understand what staking actually is, that's urban, that's just basic urban planning. That's understanding the, the phenomenology of buildings, how we, how we experience spaces. Um, yeah. So part of it is you just, it's just described as this is how they do it, and yet you're reading it for like, we read it and go, oh my God, why don't, why don't we do it that way? Right. right? 10 times more powerful than if you were like a hundred times more powerful than if we were to hear, this is how you should do it. It's just, just described. Isn't that fascinating how that works? 
It is. And then even your choice to naming, you know, different places and categories, just even in the acknowledgement of them, it comes from a place of more like life as opposed yeah. to fixing something. So like thrive yes. the hospital and so forth, as opposed to like a place for injury. It's like, we're yeah. here to help thrive. So just that switch in narrative. But I wanted yeah. to ask you about the earth thing. And for those of y'all who are like, what are you talking about? Earth, uh, earth's been brown ball, y'all. Like it's not here anymore. These characters, this world is post earth. But what I found interesting is there is this almost obsession with learning about earth. And I put here, if Earth is over and it didn't work, why are we still so obsessed with it? Right. And he discovers there are other people like him who find Earth. Right, right, right. Right. And, and like there's this almost like fragile, tender uh, love of Earth. Yeah. Like, oh, like you care for it like a, like, like a puppy or a child or something. Yeah. Like a, like, it's, it's vulnerable. Uh-huh. There, there, there's a line later that says, I don't remember who it was, but they were saying possibly you're attached to Earth because of the natural limitations it had, and you kind of envy it because we are we have so much here. And I thought that might be a possibility, but then I have a theory <laughs> I'm going to throw out there, uh, and I'm not going to do a huge spoiler, but I'm wondering if this kind of demonization of Earth and what it was and kind of the reality that starts to unfold through the end of the book of other powers that be and other things that like, oh, maybe this is all just a big distraction from this new, if the new issues coming up in this world to look at the issues at the old. Oh, fascinating. And then you discover that the pain of what happened to Earth has actually shaped all these new worlds in good ways. But then you also maybe start to see some not so good ways. It's crazy. It's, yes. it's it's so interesting. It's so interesting. Okay, okay. So I'm gonna get back. I love on, it. On look at you. Look at here. look at your like your imagination and your mind and your heart are like. I love it. I love it. You're like. Mm-hmm. I'm Isn't in this passing? world. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm in it. I'm in it. Oh, I wanted to <laughs> read two two forty three. They're talking about. It's always so weird reading somebody's book to them, but you know. <laughs> Let's just do it anyways. <laughs> All right, it's Zigame. Am I saying that correct? Zigame? That's my southern uh, way of saying it. Um, you. This is the beauty of it. We pronounce it as you pronounce it. Maybe Let's I would go. say Zigame, but now you've got me thinking Zigame, and I like Zigame better. So Zigame, Zigame. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. She goes on this spill about short time versus long time. <laughs> And yeah. there's this interview where she's telling folks, and it's a really interesting point where she's saying, we're so bent over the short time, like this present moment, and somebody dropped the glass of milk and it's everywhere, and blah, 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 when your kids are right here. And that's a long time. That's the thing that actually matters. And I thought that was a beautiful speech that she gave. But then I wrote in the book, I put that short time is also present. So keeping long time here, right? The appreciation of it, but also to being tapped into short time. I don't feel like it's an either or. I know you're speaking for Ziga May here and I plan you to bring her in to get her thoughts right, on it. Right, right, right. Because she's like, keeps going, I don't know what I'm doing. Part, mm-hmm. By the way, part way in the right, part way through in the writing, I was like, God, Rob, your characters sure give a lot of speeches. And it speeches. was like a, it was like a really interesting moment of Oh, they do, and that's how I do it. Like, yeah, my characters give lots of speeches, and and apparently that, yeah, because mm-hmm, I'm writing this book. <laughs> and so there was like a real feeling of, although almost like a question: Is it okay? And isn't that kind of on the nose? And isn't that coming mm-hmm. from you, like, not that original? And then there was like this big smile that arose, like. Yeah, no, your characters give speeches. And literally, like, Ziga May is like, I don't know why I know how to do this. I don't know why I keep giving these, you know what I mean? When they're all, like, mm-hmm. questioning him. And Heen is like, wait, that thing that you were doing, what is it? I don't understand. And she's like, yeah, I don't either. She's befuddled by these <laughs> speeches that she gives. <laughs> Which is just what so funny. She's mystified by this superpower of hers. When you're writing this, I mean... 
obviously, I mean, you've been doing this your entire life is communicating and share. And I, I know you've spoken to this quite a bit in Robcast about, you know, the Rob's ago and trying to step away from telling you something and then just letting something creative flow through. When you let stuff flow through, I mean, how, how easy is it let to let that kind of the old parts of Rob Bell that you want to keep still come through, even though you're still trying to shed that part? Does that make sense what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I don't think about it as shedding because I think about it like duct tape integrating all the, all the earlier Heathers and Robs are with us. So we draw, uh, we have to be at peace with our own history. Mm. So all the things that we got to do, all the things that happened to us, it's all with us. So it's, yeah, it's all going to come out. And so I don't think about it as shedding. I think about it as when it arises, it'll arise and it'll be <laughs> probably quite entertaining and all that will just be there. So I don't I fight that. it. I don't fight it. Mm -hmm. There's a certain ease and flow to it. Like, eat that. Like, oh, apparently Ziga May is going to give a speech now. Okay. What is she going to say? I don't know. Let's see what she says. It has like this sort of wide-eyed discovery about it. And that, this, and like this story would each morning I would sit down and let's see what happens today. Mm -hmm. mm. It's like very, very moment by moment, word by words, scene by scene. And there are quite a few scenes where I don't even know how this scene ends. I kind of know where we're headed in this scene, but then I'll find out. Yeah, we'll see. Were they ever quiet? Like when you sit down and like the characters weren't saying anything and there were no, was no progression. What did you do when that happened? Or did it? Uh, you sit with it. This came, this came pretty, this just kept coming from the get go. This was coming faster. This was coming in. It was just like, I'm here. Hmm. I'm here. Time to start typing. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's so fun to talk with people like you about it, is a number of interviewers have been, have been like, wait, 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 wait. You're talking about these characters like you did it create them. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, I guess I am. <sighs> Not because to get too so delightful. weird and woo, but I mean, they do exist. I mean, they do exist. <laughs> They and do. I mean, you think about it in our reality. Right. Like I have my own yeah. image. Yeah, all yeah. Look, so do you. Here's what's wild. This is pretty crazy. When I first, you know, going through Haynes beginning and all of that, I saw them all as cartoons. Mm. And then as the story progressed and I didn't even notice it until the end. They, I was picturing them all as humans. And so oh, it was like this weird progression. Right, from right, like, right. They're getting more and more flesh not, and blood. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. Best character in the book is Lines. Oh. I love that kid. <laughs> More than anything, that whole scene with him and he just... I feel like that was the part where he, there was so much healing in his heart from the beginning of the book. Um, gosh, it was beautiful. And there was this in it that I just wanted to kind of press into a little bit because the dialogue I felt like I was like yeah that makes sense but I still did couldn't I just want you to speak to it a little bit maybe what you meant or what lines meant by this line it was just really interesting he was talking about anxiety essentially like he gets scared and um oh stars scared stars scared he says i'm not scared of stars i can feel him bristle on my back right of course but you know how how far away stars are really far exactly really far so they're shining and they light up the sky but they also are constantly in the process of dying we studied that in school so did i that dying part got me shining and dying at the same time that's what you mean by stars scared <laughs> i thought i was like I'm star scared, and I couldn't even tell you what that even means. <laughs> the living and the dying and the shedding and the way that I interpreted that was the anxiety and the tension between a lit up life. That's what I read. But I wanted to know when you wrote that, what came up for you? Was there maybe a different story you were trying to tell there? 
It's uh, huh. It's like lines. Like, who am I to interpret this story? It's like Lines is encountering that existential abyss, the fleeting temporal nature of life. Like, oh, this experience that we're all having here comes and goes. Hmm. And for many people, if I were commenting on this, I would, what strikes me is that like, like a million cells are dying in your body every second. Same with mine. So the listeners, your listeners, a million cells die every second, but your body keeps replacing those cells with new cells. So life and death for many people are you're alive and then you die. There's life. And then after what we know to be this life comes death. But actually mm-hmm. life and death are happening within you and I right now on a scale of millions every couple seconds. So as opposed to life, then death, life and death sit side by side and are the dance that makes our existence possible. So when you move death from something then to a very real reality right now that makes all this possible, then the seasons, spring, summer, winter, fall, that's death. Um, it's our skin's constantly dying. Most of household dust is made up of human skin. So like death is the engine of life. If any of us will eat today, what we ate had to be harvested. It was alive and then it had to be pulled from the earth. So. If you move from life, then death to life and death, constantly moving with, and almost like dancing with each other that makes this possible, then there has to be something larger than life and death that life and death are actually happening within. In the same way, your body is something larger that the cellular life and death is happening within. And when death loses its power like that, now you're free in a really profound way. Mm. Now you're really free. So it's at first it's terrifying. Like, oh my God, that we're on a ball of rock hurtling through space at 67,000 miles an hour. The absurdity. You and I are talking across the country with these head <laughs> What? Yeah. The absurdity of this existence. But when you move into the heart of that, you find a, a freedom and joy that's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a really so- long riff on. Rob Bell interpreting what maybe Lines and Heen are talking about. <laughs> you know, you're the first person. I've done hundreds <laughs> of interviews before, and it's always been on, you know, nonfiction books. I've never talked to anyone about a fiction piece. And so even coming up with some of these questions, because I feel you, I was kind of like, we don't want to go back to try to narrate for these people as opposed to just experiencing yeah. it. And so it's really interesting, you know, extracting stuff from the book, but also to trying to not make it into, you know, destroy the magic in it. Yeah. You're coming in the side door. And yeah. when, when you, yeah. so notice, notice how a story you engage with it, not from a place of dominance and mastery, what are the points this person is making? How can I understand? It's already working on you in other ways. So it actually gets to the incarnational flesh and bloodness of us faster, interestingly enough. You, you engage with a story that's made up and you actually get to real, strangely enough, faster. It like opens your heart in ways that one more TED talk, one more person who has a New York times idea about brain chemistry or wow, whatever. It's fine. It's fine. It's Mm -hmm. just, it can often be heads talking to heads. Mm. This person has a, I think, I think, I think, have you, have you read so-and-so? I have, I think it's it's fine. Great. It just, uh, grief, ache, desire, longing, uh, love exists deeper in the center of our being. And you and I are, are like, we're, we're the children of a system that so prized the mind. Mm. Like, a, they're a good, oh, they were a good student. Oh, be, why? Because they got, got a grade point. So, grade point. Mm-hmm. Then they did well in the SATs. Then they went to a good college. Um, those were like the marks of intelligence. Mm. So, it located... It, it, what it called intelligence was actually an incredibly narrow s- 
seriously narrow realm of human existence. So then you just have minds talking to minds, talking to minds, and you have all this ungrieved grief in our in our world right now. You have so yeah, that's the power, that's the beauty, of mm-hmm. the, the fun of the story is you and I meet and we're in. We're we're like <laughs> we go right in all right away to all this. Yeah. Yeah, and like I said earlier, it exposes you to things that you might have not sought out before. And here's yeah. an example of that. I know a central theme through the book is loss and grief. And there's a scene at the beginning. Um, and I don't want to give it away because y'all need to read it. Okay? <laughs> but there's this <laughs> these relationships that he has in his life. And during a moment where he really needed family and needed that relationship there was just this harsh Mm. departure from it yeah ah that part out of it all the loss all the terrible stuff that happened that part hit me harder than anything and even throughout the whole book i kept thinking about that one scene and it made me question i'm like heather there's like people who freaking lost their lives you know in this book but you keep going back to but I, the word betrayal kept coming up to me, like a betrayal mm. in relationships. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying all that to say is it made me examine. I'm like, what is it about that in your own life that's not healed? Because it stuck out to you yeah, more than even the loss of life. Right, right. It's like you're reading a mirror. Like you read a story and the story reads you. Exactly. And it like has it has like a I think of it like a downed power line, like it has charge. Yeah. Yeah, and and this is this is always the invitation for us humanoids is when something has charge, you either fall. I, I think of it as like following it back to its cave. What is that? Why does that have charge? You either examine mm-hmm. those thoughts, feelings, senses, perceptions, and emotions, mm-hmm. or then you hold it down, and then have to place all that on someone else. Mm-hmm. So the, like, we're all essentially like projectors and everybody else is a screen. And they're telling us about, this person's telling us what they think about us and I'm listening to them tell me about themselves. I'm just a screen. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating how that works? <laughs> yeah. Saying out loud makes sense, but also too reminding yourself of that and keeping that perspective throughout mm-hmm, the day mm-hmm, with mm-hmm. the beauty of our emotions. Um, it's like I'm all your 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 we're learning to be present to what is arising within us and like basic self inquiry. What is that? Is that true? Mm-hmm. Is that how is that what is that? Where'd that come from? Why does that person get under my skin like they do? And if I can mm. move from why are they like that and what is wrong with them to what have they come to show me? Yeah, my, they're my two, yeah, what are they come? that's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> and you think about like uh, when people talk about, well, people have their favorite people that they can't stand and are tired of hearing about whatever famous people. Um, well, how do you I would always ask the person, how do you know about that person? What do you mean? How, mm-hmm. Well, how, just how do you know? Because at some point they clicked on a story about that person and the inner and basically when they clicked on that link they told the internet this is what i click on so no wonder you're we're all creating the internet what we click on the internet gives back to us so when we click on anything outrageous then the internet gives us more outrage that's how the algorithm works so that's what's happening for lots of people is they're realizing this thing that I can't stand, I'm the one energetically keeping it in play. I'm actually creating it. <laughs> Somebody this morning, they were talking about they. They're saying, you know, this conspiracy, like they, 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 and right, someone right, right, else right, right, right. do not realize that they is us. Yes. We yeah, are yeah. they. Yeah. So you can see when it gets ahead of steam and it sort of uh, conflagrates, let's make up a word, then you get larger like conspiracies that are all built around the them yeah. which is people telling you about themselves their own pain loss trauma chaos yeah mm-hmm. we're all going around telling the world about us 
and we keep using them as the word we use. <laughs> There's this line that says, healing the universe often takes time, my friends. <laughs> and then he laughs at the Dil Tud laugh. Like he says this line, like it's so absurd. And then he laughs like, well, you know, you know how these things go. <laughs> so, okay, this is deep AF. Like I'm just going to go there real quick, but is it, possible for this universe to ever really be healed right right it's almost like dill tud it's like when he says that he's already acknowledging the sort of i don't even know what I'm, it's almost like he's going i don't even know what i'm saying you know what i mean what what like can that what does that even mean it's just like, almost like it's almost like he's acknowledging it's a word salad but it also has a sort of yeah. power for him at the same time well, I don't, I don't remember the term you used. I was trying to find it here. I wrote it down. The, the bartering, that's what it was. Reestablishing mm. bartering mm -hmm. of like, okay, well, culture, you have to give mm. a little, take a mm -hmm. little, and there has to be kind of this balance there of good and evil. So within that context, thinking about, well, is healing ever possible if there has to ever be exchanges? Oh, oh, interesting. Oh, I thought he was just more, oh, he was just doing a riff on, here's where we're going to have to start. We'll have to, it's like almost like he's got this action plan. Or all these things that are like the most giant systems that would have to be recalibrated. And he's like listing them like they're just like, we'll have to do that first. Then we'll have to do that. You know what I mean? He's just like listing it like, then Tuesday, then Tuesday, this is what we'll do. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love yeah. how he's, he's like so earnest and sincere. And he's got like this sort of some resentment that comes out and i love that he's so well versed in all this and like 10 steps ahead but he also has like this lyrical poetry fairy like hobbit thing to <laughs> i just love him <laughs> there's definitely something more um the where what was it it was called the section 10 severs 10 severs 10 mm. that's introduced later and y'all are probably like what listen <laughs> listen just lean in a little bit lean in a little bit at the beginning of the book, there's this hierarchy called the chairs, these people who are orchestrating everything and whatever. And I think it was Heen's dad. I might be wrong on that, but it was talking about how some of the chairs were offboarded. Let's say they were fired. And he said it was the great return to dignity. And that was kind of all that was left there. Oh, teachers. Me, oh, teachers. Yeah, they, they got rid of like two thirds of the teachers and they made teaching. <sighs> They made teach. They decided that only the best of the best could be teachers, and the teachers would make way more money, and that teaching would become like. Well, there goes that question. Yeah. I thought yeah. I thought he was thinking the chairs were displaced, and I was like, "Those are the Severs Ten, But I guess I just missed right all that. Oh, Never mind. wow! There's like that's like a whole alternate storyline. Yeah, that you that's got where I going. thought this was going. But just take it, run with it. See where you get. See where it gets you. It is what it is. All right. <laughs> so let's go to the next piece. Um, I just wanted to, what time do we have? Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left, 10, 15 minutes. I just wanted to read a couple of sentences that kind of stuck out to me and just just chat about it. I mean, there's no real question to it. I just, this idea, of, is it Mayor? M-A? Mayor Dolby? Uh, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Which is a combination of ma'am and sir, which I assume you got. No, I didn't get that. Oh, yeah. But you, you, listen, I know you love words. <laughs> you talking to me is probably going to be super repulsive because I mispronounce words all the time. I I always struggle with like reading and spelling. And so I'm all, I'm super messy with words. Yeah, that's what that. Yeah. But I, I, I think we just pronounce words how we want to pronounce them. Yeah. Just like how that. you think it should be. Of course. I like that. Like, like I'm, that. I'm telling you about somebody's name on a planet somewhere in the future that I just made up, and then I'm also telling you how it's properly pronounced there. No, you go, mm -mm, that's how I say it. <laughs> Did you yeah, ever change just come right back. Just push right back on that. The characters, like maybe you saw a little bit too much Rob in it, and you had to kind of come back and readjust. Did that happen at all? No, I didn't um, I'm see myself. Say that again? I'm sorry. I didn't see myself in the characters. I don't. At all? I'm, I'm, I, I, I can't see it. My friends... Um, obviously, other people can. I'm, I'm like, yeah. Mm -mm. You know that you know, th like in dream interpretation, they talk about how in a dream, every, all the characters in dream are aspects of yourself. So they 
in a dream, you fall asleep at night, you're laying there, and your subconscious, unconscious, whatever, is making up these short films with all these separate mm-hmm. characters but they're all actually just dimensions of yourself. They just appear as separate selves. Um, so that's a bit of the experience for me. I'm, uh, they appear as separate self. Yeah. I don't well, even understand how it works. So and I'm just fascinated with it. A friend of mine um, stopped reading the book because he was trying to figure out which character I was. And he got so frustrated. He just stopped. And then like weeks and weeks or months later, he picked it up again. And he was like, and then I just read it. Like you're all the characters like that. He just couldn't, it just, just, just jacked them all up. (laughs) (laughs) When you're writing, what I, what I, what I mean is, do you ever think, Oh, Dilt, Dilt had this. And then you write it and you go down this road and then maybe he backtracks you and say, no, that's not who I am and what I think. And then you have to go down another path. No, none of them are, none of them are what I think. None, okay. none of them am I, try, I'm never trying to say something. They're saying something. And it might sound a lot like me, but I don't have any points I'm trying to make. I'm just interested in what they're experiencing. Very, very, it's, a, it's almost like a, I'm trying to think, not an altered, it has like an altered state dimension where I know that I'm actually writing all this. I'm, of course, I'm aware of that, but I'm also not. So, like, the idea of, like, this is what I want this person to say. I'm discovering what they say. Mm. Like, in a dream. Like, in a dream. Something, cool. something in a, Heather has a dream at night, wakes up in the morning, and over breakfast is, like, recounting the dream. And it's like, and then that person said this, and then that person was on a bicycle, and then there was, like, a, a guy selling bananas and this woman who kept saying, read my PhD, whatever, whatever was happening in your dream, just some duct tape, weird series of disjointed images. And you're like thinking about it, but you're also the one who came up with it. That's what I mean. It's wild. So you'd be telling your friend, I had to dream about you. Da 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 da. Like you're completely mystified by it and trying to figure out what it was and also thrilled by it. It was so strange, but you also are the one who came up with it. It's a bit like that. Where, where your friend would be like, I know you're working hard to understand this dream, but you're the one who came up with it. And you'd be like, I am? I guess I did come up with this. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> I do. I've never experienced that. And so it just, it sounds really frank. That sounds cool. Yeah, it is. I wanted to ask you about the bread piece because throughout the whole thing i'm like okay obviously there's an intention here with yeah they work at this bread shop and there's a lot of conversation around bread and rosemary and the different things you can put in it and then there's this wildly awesome scene right with nunya and she comes in and she's just like speaking to this crowd of kids but she's throwing flour on this boy (laughs) Which, by the way, the empathy that showed to me, like, a lot of empathy that she has in a soft heart, you know, where she was very selective of how she talked to these children. Was and really- healing is, like, how does she know the one kid, she just roasts him because she knows he's due and she can handle it. But then the other uh-huh. kid, he's like, by the way, how did you, how did she strike you? At first... I had I had a roller coaster with her. So at first, I loved her just because I loved her little sneaky vibe in the corner. And I'm like, okay, this is a badass chick coming in. This is kind of cool. We need this <laughs> character. But then I started getting kind of annoyed with her because I'm super protective of Heen. And yeah. like, he's going through a lot. And I don't want her to blow his cover and all this stuff. So then I'm like, back up, girl. Mm-hmm. But then when she starts showing a little bit of that empathy and she starts kind of getting brought in, I really start to like her. And then obviously towards the end... um, I'm excited to see where the both of them are going to go. Oh. I'm really excited. Yes. Good. Really, really excited. But she has this, and another thing I love about her is her communication and her confidence. She comes in and she just delivers this beautiful speech, and she goes on this riff about bread and how really the only thing you need for bread is two ingredients. And even the, quote, third ingredient is the combination of these two. Plus time. Kind of like, she was, like time is an ingredient. Time. That's what I wanted to ask you about because uh, where where is it? Where is it? Where is it? It says 
what is a universe without good bread or something like that, right? It was a fun line in it. And I was thinking about, maybe I'm thinking too deep about this, but what is a universe without this is reference? A, is it even a planet if it doesn't have good bread? Yeah, <laughs> that's the line. That's the line. So were you in, I don't know, you probably weren't because it was all channeled through you and stuff. But when you're reflecting back, I guess, on the body of work and you look at this symbolism of bread and time and just these characters, is there any tie there for you as you're observing it or is Heather just? Yeah, it's also just love of bread. I love bread. I get, there's a uh, organic sourdough loaf that this place down the hill from my, down the mountain from my house, they have a little hut under an oak tree. And Wednesday through Sunday morning, they put out these organic sourdough loaves. And you can get one and it lasts. That's it. You just love bread. I just love bread. And I love, like, if I, like, go to an actual bakery, I'll, like, sit so that I can just watch them. And I find it, I find fascinating, like, when you're in Rome on a back alley and you find this family restaurant where they make pizza and you're like, it's bread, tomato, cheese basil olive oil salt i'm fascinated with those foods that are just a couple ingredients that when Mm -hmm. they're done masterfully are so simple and yet you can never get to the end of them. they're they're Mm -hmm. always completely delightful there's something so elemental about bread and yet it has this magic to it and yet it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so simple and yet new every time. That just absolutely captivates me. And these people are just making this bread and they don't even really know how bread works. But it like we gather around it and, and like when Dill Tut has his ghost bread and he's mm-hmm. like like mm-hmm. I just uh there's something just so sincere and yeah, about bread. That's how I'd say it. Yeah, so that is a general, that is a genuine Rob Bell fascination. Yeah. People who get up early so that I can just have this bread. Like there's these people who, while I was sleeping, were doing stuff. There's like an alchemy to it. Yeah, fascinating. That's why I've always liked your work and even your podcasts and so forth is my personality always goes to like, what does that mean? And like, let's mm. make this way more complicated sometimes than mm. it needs to be. The drawing parallels sometimes between things, which is a gift, I think, in some ways. But also, too, always returning back to maybe things just are the way that they are and just enjoy it. And it doesn't have to be mm. more than I just, I like bread. Yeah. And the, the, the moments in life when you feel most alive, when we feel most connected with everything and everyone are not moments when we're standing at a distance naming or analyzing. The moments when we're just present so much in the experience that we often even lose the sense of I. Mm. Just this. Even this is saying too much. You move into this sort of wordlessness where it's just present. Like when I'm surfing, oftentimes... uh, dolphins come through and dolphins are never like hey look i'm Mm -hmm. a dolphin dolphins uh, they might chatter to each other but they don't chatter to me they're just dolphins they're dolphining and it's it's the first time it's like every time is the first time it's so moving same with whales on i can't even explain what it does and they're not saying anything or attempting to prove anything they're just pure being you don't freak out when you see a whale like underneath you. Oh yeah, it's like I can't, it's 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 something way past freaking out. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like I'm telling you what. It yeah, it's hard to yeah. If there's a wordlessness to it that is found in like the greatest pieces of music or your favorite songs. Sometimes you're singing along, but sometimes you aren't because that would ruin the moment. You're just mm-hmm. present. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's this um, line. I don't remember who said it. It's of talking about, I think it's um, Delta, if I'm not mistaken. 
saying you can't unsee what you've seen. You can't untaste <laughs> what you taste. And I was thinking about this new world that you're building and you're just getting started. I'm pretty sure with it. Pretty sure. <laughs> and I was wondering as a creative, as a communicator, as someone who is just curious and making and putting stuff out into the world, this new venture, this new world right here. Um, what about it? Have you, or will you not be able to unsee or untaste again? That, uh, there's an ease and flow. It doesn't mean it doesn't require effort. But when we're really quiet and still, and this spacious, because peace is our true nature. Everything else is just layers that get added on that. But when we're quiet and still enough that those layers fade and we're present, then things arise and they're like, ask us to follow them and make them and share them. And there's a certain effortlessness to it, even if it requires effort. That is a way of being in the world that I am learning as opposed to a lot of the more Western conjure, muster it up. It's on you work harder, mm -hmm. Heather. The answer obviously is you just aren't getting up early enough, or you just need to put in the extra workouts or you just, but the whole thing needs you to conjure it up, muster it up, rustle it up, hustle it up, grind it out. Yep. And yeah. this is all very popular at the moment. And there's a long ancient tradition that's like, or you could do it other ways. The knowing and unknowing, <laughs> the doing and undoing, the, the ways in which a clear mind that is quiet you will find reserves of energy and vitality and creativity beyond anything. So for me, I thought I was creative for 30 years. I even like went around the world talking about creativity. And then have just the past couple of years tapped into something that makes all that feel like a warm up. Yeah, makes it feel like a warm up. <laughs> and, and what's interesting is someone who watched your videos, new videos years ago and like been following this journey and so forth. Reading through this, it still has the Yeah. The different, deeper impact than a lot of the other work. And it's interesting because it's those side doors you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Like me asking myself, what what is this issue with me and like betrayal? Like where's that coming from? What needs yeah. to be healed in me? And that's yeah. something I wouldn't have sought out before without this narrative. Right, you know? right, 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 right. I'm as fascinated as you. Yeah. How am I just not I, seeing this? Amazing. I know we're getting close to time. I, I wanted to circle real quick back to you had a training. Um, what to say? Mm, something to say? Is that something, something I did? To say, something mm -hmm. to say. Yeah. I'm fascinated with communication. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to be a better communicator. Now it's words better, y'all. Working on it. Went through that, and then I circled in your last book, um, Everything's Spiritual. There's a story you tell about communication where you're saying you were trying to get a point across, and this woman came up to you, and she said, it's not about that. It's about discovering it with you, and we're just here to mm, discover mm, it with mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. And just as from a communication standpoint, stepping away, selfishly going to ask you, as someone who feels drawn to that medium, but yeah. I also am really curious about this storytelling piece because I want to bring a little bit of that more of my work. I don't think I have the muse knocking on my door like he's knocking on yours, but I want to open the door a little bit more to him, to her, to her. it. Mm -hmm. Them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious... How have you kind of invited that into your life a little bit? Um, for someone who's curious like me, what would you tell me? 
you will have encounters today. Ask people questions. People are infinitely interesting. They will... You will have more stories than you could even begin to tell just by people you meet and things you see. And then maybe just note them. Remember that person that I met who... Who did I meet a couple days ago? A woman who talks to dogs. Are you trained in this? Yeah. yeah. Tell me what kinds of things dogs tell you. Wait, people hire... Yeah, people hire me. And I talk to the dog. What kind of things... Do you, and she told me kinds of things dogs talk to her. She, like, the, the world's... <laughs> but... It's there. It's, it's, people are... What a world. What a world. So if you're still stuck in the same old, well, is that... Like, right and wrong is very helpful in a couple of categories, and otherwise it's often irrelevant. Or what is that? Is that can I can I approve it? Stop! Just stop! Just yeah. just just be with it all. Just be with it all. So you're already <laughs> you're already doing that. You're already like that story you're holding in front of you. You're already listening in sort of new ways. That will just naturally spill over into your. That'll 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 your your work and your communication will just naturally reflect the the, the questions you're already asking. It will just get more in. It will get more interesting simply because you're more interested. So more instead interested. of like, how do I make my speaking more whatever? No, no, how you're following your curiosity and you're asking new kinds of questions and you're realizing, oh, wait, everybody's my teacher. Oh, the, the work, the work will just naturally. It's almost like you look back and realize, oh, my word, the work changed. I didn't set out to write this book. I was just yeah. following something. And I noticed mm -hmm. partway through, oh, I would love talking about this. I think, I think interviews about this book, even the whole process from my other books, oh wait, I would love the process way more. And now I'm talking to you years later, and it is. It's completely 100% delightful. So I was just following something. That's all I got. Back around the very beginning, we talked about him taking in everything around him and paying attention. It's a gift. Let it in. Y'all, this will be linked up in the show notes. This book is fire. Read it. It's hilarious, too. I don't think I got to that point. I <laughs> laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. Um, thank you for writing it. Thank you for giving us just an example of what it looks like lit up and creative and still making a huge ass difference in this world through that. So, Rob, thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. <laughs>